Michael, so I wanted to ask about Michael Porter. He, he played 29 minutes last night. Obviously, 12 came in the fourth quarter. But what strikes you or what is the most impressive aspect of his growth o- over these past two rounds to the point where you feel comfortable uh, trusting him in crunch time? Well, there wasn't much crunch time last night. Okay, that's fair. I mean, so I don't know if there was a crunch time answer there. But uh, at the end of the Clipper series, there definitely was. And he's played uh, even back to the Utah series. You know, um, uh, Mike, he was playing down the stretch of close games elimination games so I think in those games the games that you talk about when he's on the floor when uh, so much is hanging in the balance uh, that's invaluable for a young player and you can't replicate that experience and uh, you know I think what's earned him those minutes is that he's really bought in grown uh, and committed to the defensive end of the floor the offensive end comes easy for Michael he's so talented he's so skilled um, and, and he can go on a score and run all by himself. His rebounding has always been there. Uh, but for him to get those minutes to close games, he has to be able to defend. And uh, I think from game one in Utah, round one, all the way through now starting the Western Conference Finals, his uh, defense imp- uh, improvement has been remarkable. And uh, I'm proud of him for that. Next, we will go to Katie Wingie. Katie, go ahead. Hey, Coach, now that you guys have had a chance to watch some of the film, what needs to be the biggest difference going into game two? Oh, I think it's obvious for anybody that watched the game is uh, just getting back. Uh, They had 35 transition points. uh, And uh, as I told our players this morning when we watched the film, you know, I I told you about this. We talked about them being the number one running team in the league. Uh, We talked about the pace at which they play with. uh, And that is off makes, that's off misses, that's off turnovers. Um, that's all free throws, uh, and we, we did a poor job of that. You know, we, we could have taken away so many easy baskets. Give them credit. That's how they play. They get the ball up the floor in a hurry, and they attack. Um, but, you know, Caldwell Pope had a great game. He had, I think, 18 points. Twelve of those came in transition. He made three threes in transition. So our urgency to get back has to be much, much higher, and we have to try to force them to play a half-court game as much as possible. I think that was a difference in us coming back against the Clippers. Uh, our defense in games five, six, and seven was just uh, terrific. Uh, last night, that was not the case. And for us to try to even the uh, series up, it'll have to start and end with that transition, Katie. Next, we'll go to Jeff Zilgit. Jeff, go ahead. So Michael, I, I, it's similar to that question. Do you feel any better after watching it uh, than you did last night? Um, you know, that feel that these things are, are really correctable and it really wasn't as bad um, as you thought it was last night. And I have a follow-up as well. Yeah, it's still bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's still bad. Um, you know, you knew it was bad during the game. And then when you watch the film and uh, you realize, you know, they got just way too many of those. But I guess the, it, a little bit of a silver lining to our team is if we just improve in that one area, that could be a huge difference. The difference from being in the game and not in the game. Uh, you know, we closed the first quarter on a 16 to eight run. We take a two point lead, start the second quarter. They started the second quarter on a 17 to one run. During that stretch, we had six turnovers for seven points. And then we started getting too, uh, caught up in the referees and the fouls, lost our focus a little bit. Uh, but you know, though that run 17 to one in the second quarter, they went on another, a third quarter rather, they went on another big run to push the lead from nine points to 21 points. And the game was uh, over at that point. But, um, yeah, I think our guys understand, if, if anything else, our, the Anthony Davis isolation post-up, the LeBron James pick and roll, if we just take care of the transition, we will be in the ball game. So I think that that is a silver lining of uh, all the problems that it gave us last night. And then just real quick, if you count Courtney Kirkland on the court last night, there were four – people on the floor from Flint, Michigan um, last night. And going back to your mission. Who was the third? Um, you have Monty Morris, Cal Kuzma, and JaVale McGee. Um, I know Kuzma and Monte and yeah. Courtney and then the... Uh, JaVale McGee. Oh, JaVale, okay. Yep. How about that? And, and so going back to your Michigan days, uh, what, what do you remember about Flint, Michigan and its basketball history and, and, and trying to get guys from Flint to play wherever you were coaching? Yeah, I mean, you know, the Flintstones, you know, they, they have so many great players that have come out of there. And just more recently for me, you know, having the, the privilege to coach Monte Morris, 
who I think one day will run for mayor of Flint and win. You know, uh, Monte Morris is uh, so proud of where he comes from and he gives back so much. When we played in Detroit, uh, you know, a few times since we've had Monte, we've had team events in Flint, gone up there, gone to a mall, handed out, uh, you know, clean water to uh, the people up there. Um, but, you know, tough area, tough city. And, and I think, you know, the one thing about people in Flint is that uh, they use that toughness as a source of pride, you know, and, and a chip on their shoulder. And uh, guys that I've been able to be around from Flint have always kind of had that chip on their shoulder. So, uh, but I was unaware of that. That's, that's pretty, I knew Coos and I knew uh, Monte, obviously. I did not know JaVel and Courtney were from uh, uh, from Flint. Courtney doesn't seem like a guy from Flint to me. His dad was one of the all-time great basketball coaches really? in the state. Okay. Yeah. But when I, I worked for Greg Campy at Oakland University, I get out of college. And, uh, you know, Coach Campy uh, was ahead of his time, the three point shot. We were Division II at the time, but just driving all over the state of Michigan from Saginaw, Flint, Grand Rapids, and, and recruiting. And a uh, great state for basketball. And obviously, I think Flint's um, tradition of great basketball, high school basketball players, speaks for itself. Next, we'll go to Vic Lombardi. Vic, go ahead. Coach, you talk about – hello, Coach. Sorry yep. about that. Sorry. So many teams want to get in transition, try to, and they can't. What, what specifically do they do that they can get into that transition mode so quickly? They run. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of teams say they want to run, but they're not in shape to do so for 48 minutes. Uh, every, every player you talk to says, we have to run more. Uh, well, get out and run. Sprint the floor. And uh, their, their ability to co convert from defense to offense is remarkable. And I think the second thing about it, Vic, is that they have a, a player in LeBron James who is, uh, could very well be the best passing forward ever to play the game. And he's always looking up the floor. They have bigs that are athletic, put pressure on the rim. They have wings that are disciplined and dedicated to getting out on the break. And the ball is thrown up the floor. They're used to the advanced pass as opposed to always using the dribble. The ball obviously travels much faster than in the air than it does on the ground. Uh, and they use all that to their advantage. So um, a lot of people talk about it, they do it. And uh, it's, it's definitely was a concern coming into the series. And my only hope, Vic, is that after feeling it, you can talk about it, you can try to prepare people for it, but once you're up against it and you really feel it, uh, I think that's when it take, uh, takes hold. So hopefully, uh, going into game two, our guys understand that and we can be a lot more disciplined because there were times even when we were back, we just didn't point and talk and communication will clear up a lot of confusion and take away some of the easy threes that we allow them to walk into. All right, next we'll go to Om Young Maisuk. Om, go ahead. Uh, hey, Michael. Um, I wanted to ask you, you had said after the game last night that you were going to watch the film to see what you see in the calls, why they were called, and should they have been called? I was wondering what your assessment was after watching the film. Yeah, it's, uh, we just have to play better. You know, I'm not going to – I think we allowed that second quarter free throw discrepancy to really uh, take root and get us uh, to lose our focus, and that, that can't happen. We, we're going to have enough of a hard time trying to beat the five guys on the floor. Uh, we can't worry about playing, you know, uh, five against eight. It's uh, – the referees are a part of it. And we did foul at times. Uh, do we agree with every call? Of course not, whoever does. But uh, that had nothing to do with the game. You know, we, we have to focus on what we can control. That's getting back in transition. That's playing better pick and roll defense against LeBron James. That's rebounding the basketball better. That's taking care of the ball at a higher level. And, uh, and not worry about the officials out there because uh, we don't have time to worry about that. All right, we have time for one more. We'll end with... TJ McBride. TJ, go ahead. Hey, Coach. Going back to Michael Porter Jr. for a second, what can you say about the mental fortitude that he's shown? Because he has been attacked, being that he is a rookie playing in his first postseason. Guys like LeBron and Rondo are going at him, and it seems like it hasn't thrown him off. Is that impressive to you, and what can you say about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we've seen the same thing all three series now, right? I mean, whenever Michael's in the game, they're going to try to put him in some type of action uh, to create an advantage. And uh, I think one thing Michael has realized, and we've shown the film, we've worked with him, and, and tried to come up with ways to protect him, is that if he wants to be on the floor, 
he has to be a much better defender. He can't be a liability. So from game one, as I mentioned earlier, to, to all the way through now as we start uh, and get ready for game two of the Western Conference Finals, uh, there's been tremendous growth and commitment because I think he understands that unless I show improvement here, I'm going to have a hard time being on the floor, especially in crunch time uh, when the game is uh, you know, on the line. So give him credit. Uh, I think he's a young player uh, that is competitive uh, and wants to be out there, takes pride. And I always go back to uh, when the playoffs started, TJ. I asked him the question, do you want to be a great scorer or do you want to be a great player? If you want to be a great player, you got to buy into the other end. And, uh, and he's shown that he wants to, and he's shown that commitment. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to help him as much as we can. All right, that'll do it. We appreciate it, Coach. Thank you. All right, appreciate it. Thanks, brother.